I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's event. As your president, I am delighted to have our, our speaker. But I would like to preposition why we ask him to speak tonight. I'm, I'm Brian Herman, our vice president of policy planning. We'll not do the personal introductions of our speaker. But I'd like to bring to attention how youth is important to the Commonwealth. If you notice behind me, the Commonwealth Charter that all 52 nations in the Commonwealth sign and support, one of the ones is importance of young people in the Commonwealth. The number one program the Royal Commonwealth Society of Ottawa has is the National Student Commonwealth Forum. What makes this so special? Uh, before our speaker came in, I'll uh, just maybe highlight. We have a number of people who are MPs who come through our program. The heads of uh, uh, global affairs programs, uh, going around the world representing our, our nation. CEOs of a lot of companies. Politicians uh, politically in, in uh, our provinces and territories. We have a, this is a leadership development program we've run for 46 years. 46 years. Why is it that we're doing this? Uh, we're doing this for the uh, purposes right behind me of the importance. But what makes the NSCF really different from a lot of other leadership development programs is that it is youth led. The government of Canada not only wants to have uh, youth programs, they want youth led opportunities. That's what NSCF is. I'd like to bring your attention to the fact we have our shop, our Shakespeare and the uh, Platform competition coming up in a month, where there are going to be $1,250 in prizes. Please join us, see our video uh, on our YouTube channel. And finally, we have Secretary General Khan of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association coming uh, in uh, a week and a half and will be speaking at Carleton University to students. You're invited. All these flyers are in the back. Youth is important. It's youth is important to Canada, it's important to the Commonwealth, and it is important to the future of our world. May I ask Brian Herman now to introduce his speaker. Have been uh, have been affected, Parliamentary Secretary, a little bit by the weather. So I hope you'll forgive the room for not being full. Um, I promised I would be brief because uh, Mr. Shifke has some other engagements. He's just come from several votes in the House of Commons. I think uh, the Magnitsky Act was passed. One of them, Jewish Heritage Month was passed, and several others. Um, many of which will be of interest to the members, but I'm sure you're going to read about it in Hanser diligently tomorrow. <laughs> so you all have received the biography of Mr. Shifty, so I won't repeat it other than to just highlight uh, a, few, a few points. He's Member of Parliament for Vaubroy Sulam. Uh, he's the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister for Youth. So I think it's wonderful that given the Royal Commonwealth Society's emphasis on youth, that he could be with us tonight. He represented Canada at the recent meeting in Kampala, Uganda of Commonwealth Youth Ministers. And we hope he'll talk a little bit this evening about his experience, as well as the Prime Minister's and the Canadian government's agenda on youth, which we've been reading a lot about. Um, he is, as the biographer says, an expert on sustainable and community development. Um, he co-founded Youth Action Canada, which I think means that he's very well qualified for the position he has as parliamentary secretary. Uh, he was national director of Climate Reality Canada, which has links to former Vice President Al Gore. And I say that I spend a certain amount of my time in the Department of Foreign Affairs working on climate change, but when I tell young people I did IPCC 1 and COP 1, 
they sort of look at me and they scratch their heads and say, how could that be? But it's true. Back in 1989 to 1992, I spent three years doing nothing but climate change at what is now Global Affairs. He has a passion for humanitarian, <coughs> environmental, and social causes. And I hope that after he speaks, uh, we'll have an opportunity to engage him through questions and answers, and I'll be gladly moderating that afterwards. So uh, I won't say more than that, other than that, we're delighted, Mr. Shifty, that you could join us, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Herman, for the wonderful introduction. Mr. Evanick, members of the Royal Canadian uh, Commonwealth Society board here, uh, members and guests, and of course, the youth who have joined us on Thursday night, or Wednesday night, thank you very much. There's actually an event happening just close to the hill. It's a beer festival or beer drinking uh, tasting <laughs> exercise. So I even more so appreciate your presence here and choosing to be all of the wonderful, uh, tasty beers that they're offering. Um, thank you for welcoming me here this this evening. The one thing I want to point out before I even get started and get to my remarks is it's really great to be in a room with people who understand what Hansard actually is. <laughs> I say that anywhere else. Nobody has a clue what I'm talking about. So, as was pointed out uh, in the introduction, my name is Peter Schieke and I am a proud member of Parliament for uh, what I would say is the most beautiful riding in the country. It's called the Voice of Knowledge and I think all SMPs refer to our ridings that way. But I also have the honour and the pleasure of serving as the Parliamentary Secretary to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, for Youth Affairs. I'm honored to be here today at the Royal Can the Commonwealth Society of Ottawa to talk to you about our government's sincere belief in the value and the role the Commonwealth can play in helping all 52 member nations succeed. And to share with you some of the insights, as was alluded to, from my experience in Uganda this summer, where I was able to spend seven days with some incredible uh, counterparts from over 30 other Commonwealth nations to discuss how we can all work together to better serve young uh, Canadians and youth in their respective countries. As you all know, Canada is a proud and committed member of the Commonwealth of Nations. Connected by a rich history and shared values, Canada and its 51 partners across the globe are working each and every day to advance the principles of democracy, good governance, and equal opportunity. The Commonwealth Charter underlines one of its guiding principles as consensus through consultation. And here in Canada, we believe the same. There can be no progress without shared interest, and no shared interests without shared values. Across Canada, our shared values are echoed to one another through our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees all Canadians their fundamental rights and outlines that we are a nation founded on the principle of the supremacy of the rule of law. The supremacy of our laws is accepted because they are done in the interests of the Canadian people and in the hopes of enshrining democracy, freedom, and tolerance. In 1982, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada and Head of the Commonwealth, said that the decision to take pride in Canada's diversity of cultures through the Charter was a defining moment in our history. To be a part of the Commonwealth is to recognize that those values are transferable among all partner nations. With the importance of our connection to the Commonwealth in mind, from August 1st to August 6th, I was proud to represent Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Government of Canada at the 9th Commonwealth Youth Ministers Meeting in Kampala, Uganda. Somewhere, those of you who don't know, I had the pleasure of working for over five years. It was the first job I ever had at the University. There, I was overwhelmed and humbled by the passion of the over 30 other member states in attendance at affirming their commitment to the youth of their nations. Section 13, once again, as alluded to earlier, of the Commonwealth Charter recognizes that for the Commonwealth and the world to succeed, so must our youth. We all recognize that their future is indeed the Commonwealth's future. One third of the world's young people, aged 15 to 29, live in the Commonwealth. More than ever before, we have an opportunity to deliver on the principles that hold our 52 nations together to these 1.2 billion young people. In Kampala, the Government of Canada and our Commonwealth partners brought the world closer to doing just that. The meeting came on the heels of a major change for the Commonwealth. With about 2 billion youth in the world and 1.2 billion in the Commonwealth and over 7 million living in here in Canada alone. 
we can and must do more to finally provide young people with the world we promised them so long ago. That is a world that values democracy, peace, and development. Hand in hand with our local governments and international partners, that means developing and implementing policies across borders will create opportunities for young people where none existed before. The meeting began with an opportunity to share what we are doing, respectively, and to share best practices. And in that regard, I was proud because I had a lot to share. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, we've taken proactive steps to create a Canada that presents a great future for our young people. One that we'll be proud of. First and foremost, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau became the first Prime Minister in history to also take on the role of Minister of Youth. By doing so, the Prime Minister committed to the causes and needs of young people all across Canada, whether they be in regards to education, jobs, skills, or by helping to build a Canada they will be proud to call home, or one they will be proud to say they come from when traveling overseas. Like in the Commonwealth, the future of Canada is the future of our youth, and we owe it to them to succeed. Under the Prime Minister's leadership, we assured record investments in areas that will directly impact the lives of Canadian youth. They were developed through the consensus by consultation process the Commonwealth has used so successfully. Many young Canadians shared the same stories that I've heard in my travels across the country, as has the Prime Minister. They share that they have no experience, and because they have no experience, they can't find work. But we can't find work because they have no experience. It's a vicious cycle, and one that continues to this day. We set out to change that. We doubled investments to the Canada Summer Jobs Program in 2016 and created over 70,000 meaningful and well-paying jobs to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. As part of the youth employment strategy, we also invested in skills training so that young people can find the jobs they need in a new and innovative economy. When they, when they graduate, we make sure that we provide them with the resources necessary to find jobs by ensuring they have the experience that they gained in a university through the creation of 60,000 new co-op programs. We increased our investments to the Canada Student Grants Program by over 50%, providing more youth in Canada with opportunities to fulfill their dreams of earning a post-secondary or trade degree. We're working hard to strengthen that nation-to-nation -nation relationship, particularly with Indigenous youth. That includes doubling our initial investment to the post-secondary support program, which provides grants to Indigenous youth who also wish to earn their post-secondary degrees. This wholesome approach is designed to place young people on an equal footing when they exit school and enter the workforce. After all, their success is our success. But our work to empower young Canadians doesn't and will not end with more investments. This process also includes a sincere belief that young people must have a say in their government and the course and direction that their country takes. That's why we created the first ever Prime Minister's Youth Council, a body composed of young Canadians from diverse array of regions, backgrounds, and identities, aged 16 to 24. Its members are tasked with advising the Prime Minister four times per year, in person, and various times throughout the year over the phone, on how and what methods by which our government will move forward to meet the needs of Canada's youth today and Canada's youth tomorrow. As Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister for Youth, I work closely with these aspiring young Canadians. It's a key part of my job. And I'm there to help them develop, put in place proposals that will impact Canadians from coast to coast to coast. This representation is tangible, it's impactful, and it's central to the idea of governance by consultation. And as the Prime Minister, in his capacity as Minister of Youth, he's informed in every single ministry to ensure that every single decision that we take as a government, before making that decision and implementing that policy or program or investment, we apply a youth lens to that decision to see how it's going to benefit young people and if there are any adverse effects, how can we mitigate or completely eliminate those adverse effects? It's the first time in history that that's being done. The Commonwealth Youth Ministers meeting in Uganda wasn't simply about sharing best practices and individual actions. It was also focused on resourcing and financing youth development. I was proud to discuss how our government's policies are working today and will continue to work into the future. The 32 youth ministers that were present and over 300 delegates that attended the summit 
issued a declaration addressing these issues, central to the Commonwealth's success in the decades to come. We agreed that for the policies on youth jobs, inclusion, and ultimately the success of our youth to work, we needed to address the skills gap that currently exists because of our increasingly digital and technological world. Jobs, education, and indeed our Commonwealth economies must adapt and change to meet the opportunities and the challenges of the 21st century. And that success depends on the strength of public-private partnerships, the work of governments, alongside NGOs for sure, and the ability of governments in the Commonwealth to find new and innovative ways to work together. We pledge to do so across the many regions and governments of our Commonwealth through the creation of a new Commonwealth Ministerial Task Force, a task force that Canada is proud to say that it was elected to be a part of. It will champion the policy recommendations of the ninth Youth Minister's meeting, agreed upon by the dozens of nations present. Consensus by consultation drove our discussions and deliberations, giving our priorities the weight of the Commonwealth's 2.4 billion voices. We also learned, however, and this is a key point that I want to stress, of the importance of sharing not only our successes, but also the challenges that we continue to face. By learning from one another, we can avoid costly mistakes can waste invaluable and limited precious resources. In that spirit, I was able to share with my colleagues from the Commonwealth that in Canada, we face serious challenges, providing equal opportunity to our Indigenous, Métis, and Inuit youth. And these challenges are challenges perhaps are not faced by non-Indigenous youth. I shared that even though a country as rich as Canada has had many successes, we've had many failures. I shared that even though a country as rich as Canada has over 100 indigenous communities that still do not have access to clean drinking water. I shared the challenges that we face in providing sufficient mental health services to young Canadians, particularly those living in reserves and on reserves. And this has led to suicide rates amongst our young indigenous youth that are 11 times the national average. I share these unfortunate truths because the reality is that no country has gotten it 100% right. We are all indeed a work in progress. And by sharing our challenges, we can help each other grow. Overall, myself and my fellow representatives from around the world focused much of our time figuring out how to get, bridge the gap between countries like Canada who have the privilege of access to the world's best resources, universities, and research, and those with no research base at all. In Canada, we benefit from evidence-based policy. Many of our government, or Commonwealth partners, unfortunately, don't have that choice. Representatives from member states explain that they want evidence-based policy to be the norm in their own countries, but they simply didn't have the resources to do so. In that end, in that regard, we realize that Canada and a select group of member states are in an incredible position to work with our partner countries to move forward by leveraging our research capacity for the good of all those who call the Commonwealth home. By providing the opportunity for each country to share its best practices on youth development, we can reduce waste and continue to push the boundaries on what we call what we can collectively do for the future of our young people. Leveraging our collective capacity will be our strength moving forward as it has been in the past. A couple things I want to share with you before I conclude. By 2020, the GDP of the Commonwealth's 52 independent states will surpass $13 trillion. And given that trade between member nations is typically one-fifth the cost of trading with other economies, we were guided by the idea that we are indeed at a crossroads. We act now and seize the opportunity to invest in our 1.2 billion youth, the 7.1 million living here in Canada. We will be providing nearly a billion young people with the chance to succeed in one of the world's largest shared economies, where all members share similar values, language, principles, and a common vision for the future. We are motivated to issue a meaningful and far-reaching declaration because our common goal is the wealth of one another. We all share in creating the gateway to success for our youth, and the whole world will be better for it. And that vision is not new, but for the first time in our history, young people are being placed at the forefront of our vision for the future. 
It's an idea based on the capability of the individual to succeed and be a small but key part of a much larger movement. In Canada, that movement prioritizes principles like sustainability, investments in the middle class, and a sincere belief that we are stronger because of our differences, not in spite of them. And is led by a Prime Minister who's taken a hands-on approach for the first time in history to ensure that every single young Canadian has the best possible chance of realizing their full potential. In Uganda, I saw firsthand that we are on the right track to ensuring that the vision becomes a reality for all member states. Our government will continue to work hard for young people in Canada, in the Commonwealth, and across the globe. Our world will be better for it. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's just something as uh, a little small memento of our thanks for your coming out tonight. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> I have to say, actually, I'm going to go over here and then I'll go over here. Yeah. Um, I'll just add that this will probably be a really good reading for my son. I read to my son every morning around 5 o'clock in the morning. He's three years old, he loves pictures. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but does, does this fold out and yes, turn into very long? I remember this. I read this a very long time ago, and I think my son's going to enjoy this as well. So we'll put that aside. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, sir, pleasure. Thanks very much for your remarks. Very insightful, and, and I know that they will be of interest to everybody, particularly uh, the younger people in the audience. Um, and I'd like to sort of open it up to questions from them, but maybe I can just start with one. Sure. And that is the, we've read an awful lot about the Prime Minister's Youth Council. Yes. So do you see a role for the Youth Council perhaps helping sort of advance the objectives that the Commonwealth Youth Ministers agree to in the power? Good question. Um, I think they definitely have a role. We've had significant discussions on Canada's role internationally. One of the meetings that we had with the Youth Council, which was actually held this past spring, was focused on uh, two, key, um, <coughs> two key points. First was our relationship with um, Indigenous youth across the country and how the government can better serve Indigenous youth and meet the challenges that they face. And the other half was Canada's role abroad. Um, they provided incredible insight Keeping in mind they represent all the provinces, all the territories, uh, gender balance, we have representation from Indigenous youth, lived experiences. Really, this is an array of young Canadians that represent different backgrounds, different ideas. They were able to provide incredible feedback to the Prime Minister as well as several ministers on how to move forward. What are some of the things that they agree with? Some of the things that they see as key challenges that need to be addressed. Um, and so I think moving forward with the commitments that we've made in Uganda, I think they're definitely going to play a role. And I think that, given that I will most likely be working diligently on the action committee that was formed for the first time at this meeting, I will be reaching out to them and most likely having my own meeting with them to discuss how we can better implement those. And I think they'll definitely have a role to play in how we're going to use the resources of the different uh, research centers and universities that we have across the country to work with our partners in the Commonwealth um, to provide them with the resources that they're looking for and the research that they're looking for to make evidence-based uh, decisions. Okay. Thank you. I have a few other questions we've got ahead of time, but perhaps I'll turn over Actually, to you. Actually, we're going to have some of the area. Did you make your way out here from, uh, from Vaudreuil or from our area? No, I'm in Waterloo, but I was in Vaudreuil. Well, good to see you. Does everybody know that you took part in the uh, a big day on the hill. Uh, yes, so we actually have an incredibly young lady here who took my seat during the Women on the Hill event. The, uh, what was the exact name? Daughters of the Boat. Daughters of the Boat, um, where all 338 spots in the House of Commons were taken up by incredible young women from across the country. And she was able to take my spot in the House of Commons. <laughs> okay. 
So did you have any questions? I actually hear there's journalism, journalism students here. Is that possible? There you go. So, you know, whatever, you just jump at it. Which one you want to take care of and stab at it first? Well, uh, first off, uh, thank you for coming in tonight. Uh, you mentioned indigenous youth quite a bit. Yeah. In this speech. What do you think has been, like, sort of the biggest developments uh, for indigenous youth since your government has taken uh, Good question. Um, I would have to say from a, from a services point of view, from a services standpoint, the pledge that the Prime Minister made to ensure that we had no communities in Canada that were on oil water advisors within five years. Most people, and I know when I go across the country, I bring this up because we can't shy away from the challenges that we face. If we're just kind of pushing them in the corner, nobody knows about them, nobody's going to demand to be addressed. So we actually want to bring it to the forefront. Um, it's an incredibly daunting challenge to do that in five years. What we're actually experiencing right now, and what I've been seeing speaking with my colleagues, because now there are two ministers that deal directly with Indigenous Affairs and Indigenous Services. Um, and there's Jane Philpott, who was just transferred from the Ministry of Health portfolio. Uh, we've been successful in providing clean drinking water for X number of communities, while at the same time, other communities that weren't currently on a boil water advisory fell back into a boil water advisory. And so when you're trying to measure the pros and progress that you're making, you're actually making progress to those that were currently under a boil water advisory and were over 100 when we took office. You make progress in reducing that number. And then while you're reducing that number, you're getting information to tell you that there are X number of communities that are, their water systems are failing them. And when you want to put that in perspective, I mean, take for granted the fact that every single one of us has access to clean drinking water. If you didn't have access to clean drinking water, what impact would that have on your life? Everything from cooking your food to bathing to you name it, right? So the basic needs of indigenous youth across the country are not being met in far too many communities. So I think that's something that we are working diligently towards. We're making progress. Prime Minister uh, is very committed to meeting that target. So that would be the first thing I've mentioned. Um, the second, I think, is this general uh, devotion and commitment to really reinforcing that nation-to-nation -nation relationship and recapturing that nation-to-nation -nation relationship, where decisions that are made are made with indigenous leaders across the country, not making decisions and then forcing them upon different communities across the country. That has not worked. It has never worked. And so, I think that's something that, when I speak to indigenous youth across the country, it's something they greatly appreciate. They, they feel that there's a general sense that this prime minister is committed to moving forward with reconciliation and ensuring that we're doing everything that we can to put in place all of the, the promises that were made by our government um, and to ensure that we're rectifying the mistakes of the past as best possible. So I think it would be twofold. Great question. Yeah? Um, so you mentioned that there's like a skills gap between the technology the technological age. How are or what strategies are we gonna make to combat this like fast moving technology age where there's jobs for <coughs> So first thing is uh, investing in uh, research and development, investing in our universities. Uh, if we are going to provide our young people with the best shot at success, we need to make sure that our universities have the resources necessary to teach them what they need to know. And so uh, in our recent budget, we had $2 billion that was uh, allocated specifically for uh, providing funding to universities. And most of that have, has been announced across the country. Um, many universities were provided with the funding necessary to build new labs, to provide new uh, innovation hubs, <coughs> which are going to provide young people across the country with, that, with those resources necessary to really get those jobs that we're looking for. If we look at the jobs that are being created now, more and more so for young people, they're in the innovation tech sector, right? And the problem that we're facing is one of the first meetings that I had when I came into office was with a group of uh, companies that were uh, the gaming industry. It was actually, I gotta say, for those of us old enough to remember, 
I'm a Nintendo guy, okay, so I go back to Nintendo days. And then there's the kind of new generation of the, I don't even know what there is now, PS4? Okay, maybe, no? There you go. But, one of the first meetings that I had that um, I was able to, to, uh, to kind of chair for about two hours before the Prime Minister came in was with the presidents of Nintendo, uh, who else was there? It was Nintendo, Sony, um, you name it. It was, it was basically living my childhood dreams, being in that room. And I think the first thing that I said to them was, thanks for all the great memories. <laughs> but one thing they came to the table, and they had something very serious to share with us was, they said, we're not here asking for money. Which is rare when you have people coming into the government. Usually people are there to say, we'd like funding for something. They said, what we're looking for is we need you to make sure that we have the educated population necessary to fill the 600 positions that we want to fill tomorrow. And unfortunately, we don't have that. We're not turning them out here in Canada fast enough. And so what we end up coming to you for is, can we get that permit to bring in 100 people from X country or 50 from this country because they have the expertise that we need to help our company grow? And so when, we, when we're facing 600 well-paying, stable, great jobs for young Canadians, but we can't fill them, our focus needs to be on giving young people the tools to meet the demands of the new emerging economy in this country. And so that's a big component of what we're doing to help young people succeed, is investing to make sure they have the resources to do so. And also the co-op programs, the 60,000 positions we're going to be creating with the co-op programs, is going to provide them with placements that will allow them to better compete with what is now more of an international pool of applicants, right? So if a company's looking to hire, they're not only going to look at your, your education and your degree, they're also going to say, do they have any experience working in a company that does what we do? And so co-op placements are becoming more and more so necessary to compete on an international scale. That answers your question. We have another question here. Do you want to go? Oh, uh, you talked a lot about how the government has sort of shifted to what's the new more than forefront. Yes. I uh, was just wondering if you noticed any shift on, in terms of the new side, if there are responses to that towards the new programs that's changed as well. Uh, I would say yes, but only after finding new and innovative ways to inform them of <coughs> the programs that currently exist. And one of the challenges that we faced was there was a decade where there really wasn't a lot in terms of youth investment. Uh, there weren't any innovative programs announced. Um, there weren't really any programs that provided opportunities for, um, you know, employment opportunities for young Canadians. And so now we've come out with all these great programs. And when I go into universities, I say, how many of you know that we increased bursaries by 50% and made them progressive so that it, it provided more money to those that need it and less money to those that didn't, right? Which is huge for so many young people, including myself. I had to take out loans when I went to university. Um, so it's really getting the message out. But once you do, they go, oh my god, that's amazing, thank you. But uh, you really have to find new and innovative ways to do that. We've tried town halls, we've tried going to universities, uh, going classroom to classroom, which would be quite daunting, you can imagine. 